What a great way to end the day. Quiet. I could use my imagination and pretend I'm on some northern lake. However, this is a storm pond that's behind a big chain store. And I'm just out here taking chance for his evening stroll. And I figured what a great way to start a video, even though I won't be finishing it this way, to talk very briefly about the daisies. As you can see, this area is a waste area. I don't think I would ever trust anything here in terms of edibility. Apart from the fact that there's more goose droppings than anything else here. But daisies, they're here to help remedy the soil. They love waste areas. And before this got plowed over, I'm sure there were lots more. I'm going to take a little stroll up here. The oxeye daisy is perhaps one of the most highly recognized plants that are edible, perhaps next to the dandelion. The flowers are edible. Well, when they're in good shape, these ones are getting past the uh, best before date, of course. There's a nice little patch over here. Ooh, I don't know if you can see that. Wait till it hits the horizon. There goes a blue heron. Anyway, <laughs> I get so easily distracted by nature. Right there is a big patch of the oxeye daisies. And there are some in here. The flowers are edible. The leaves are edible. And for now, I'm going to end this part of the video. And I'll be back at a better location to talk more about this tomorrow. Before I get into doing the video about daisies, I just want to show you a look-alike. From a distance, you may think you're coming toward a patch of daisies. Same type of flower head. But check out the leaf structure. It's more fern-like or feathery-like. No, this isn't chamomile. Some people may call it fake chamomile, but this is called stinking mayweed. And I'll put a link to this below. Daisies, the oxide daisy. So simple, so beautiful. And of course, it's the logo of ediblewildfood.com. There are plenty of daisies here, although in some areas they are way more prolific because daisies are an indicator of poor soil and they're doing their part in trying to help correct that. So often they get the name of being totally invasive or noxious and I don't get that because how about you look at the understanding as to why there are so many of them. But for the forager, that's good news. I'm going to try to stand here in the shade. It's a very warm day already and it's first thing in the morning. So the perennial is, or the, the daisy is a perennial plant. And this stands anywhere from one to three feet tall. And you'll find these throughout North America, including all the way up into the Yukon, Labrador, and right into California. Now, California may also have a different variety, but nonetheless, if it is a variety of the Leucanthum vulgare, it is edible. Now, there's also the Shasta daisy, and I'm going to stop right here and do a quick comparison 
between the Shasta Daisy and the Ox Eye. And here's the comparison between the Shasta Daisy and the Ox Eye Daisy. Although that one looks like it's been through a war or something. It's not looking too good. But anyways, it's good enough to let you know the size difference. And of course, look at the difference between the leaf structure of the Shasta Daisy and the Ox Eye Daisy. The Shasta Daisy has a Latin name of Leucanthemum X Superbum, which was developed by Luther Burbank in the early 19th century. This is the result of making hybrids from the wild ox eye daisy. So you'll see that the leaves are definitely much thicker, they're more succulent, the flower heads are definitely much, much larger, and Obviously these were developed to adorn a garden bed as these do last much longer than the oxide daisies. So there you go, here's the comparison. Now, let's go back to the daisies. The oxide daisies that is. The oxide daisy has a terminal flower head. It's a solitary flower. And it measures anywhere from one to two inches across. This is just under two inches. Most of these ones are. And you'll notice that because these are in the aster family, and the aster family used to be considered the composite family for very good reason. The white petals here are the ray florets. And the center's right here. And let me see if I can try to, it's not gonna work because it wants to be breezy. Uh, anyways, the center is actually what's called disc florets. And now the outer petals, there's usually 15 to 30. And those disc florets, the yellow ones, are so tiny I'm sorry, I can't convert this one into inches because it's so small, four millimeters, but there's four to 500 of those yellow disc florets. Got a nice bird happening, of singing over there. And we have a very anxious chant saying, I want to go swimming. Okay, so each of these flower heads are going to produce roughly 250 seeds. So it is quite vigorous. And one plant, uh, let's see, if we can get into the base here, all these here that my hand is holding, this is all one plant. And one plant has the capability of producing up to 26,000 seeds. However, more than likely, it is three to 4,000. So it really depends on the location and circumstances. Now the leaves, well, there he is in the flowers. <laughs> the leaves are, they form a basal formation and I'm not gonna be able to find that here very well. So I'm going to include a photograph at the end of this video. However, they form a basal formation, which is basically the, wait a minute, here we go. Let's see if we can see that. You can see the leaf here. It's spatulate, which means it's spatula-like because it has the spoon part and the long stem. And there's your basal formation. Beautiful, beautiful. Being a perennial, this means this one will not grow until next year. As we go up the stem, the leaves become narrow. They still have a bit of that spatulate look to it, although they become more narrow. And depending on the size of the plant will depend on the length and the width of the leaf. But I'll put a description down below. Oh good, he's settling down. And right here, you'll see the root system 
is very shallow. Not bad, <laughs> considering it's sustaining quite the length of growth here. Alrighty, so, some cool facts. If you drink milk that comes from a cow that has eaten daisies, you're gonna find the taste is most disagreeable. However, my personal opinion, I think milk is disagreeable in terms of taste anyway. I've never been fond of milk. During the Iron Age, there were apparently in excavations, they discovered seeds from that date back to the Iron Age. Margaret of Anjou had daisies embroidered on her robes before she sailed to England to marry Henry VI. And apparently she led his troops in the War of the Roses with her banners that had images of daisies on them. Daisies are a plant that are valued for their antispasmodic, antidiuretic, or sorry, diuretic and tonic qualities. And apparently this can be used in salves for helping to treat sores. In terms of science, it's really hard trying to find a lot of information in regards to the nutrient value. Check this out, see? Very, very, very tall. However, what is known in the leaves, there are more than 500 units of vitamin A. Apparently there's 34 milligrams of vitamin C in those leaves as well per 100 grams. Now you can eat the leaves, eat the flowers. As the leaves mature as they are right now, they're gonna taste more acrid or more bitter, which isn't exactly too thrilling, but at least you know they're still edible. There's no seeds here right now, but when you do find seeds, they're rich in lineolic acid. They have 24% proteins, 26% fats in those seeds. And the surface extracts of these flowers, they have flavonoids. Both the flowers and the leaves have been proven to have luteolin and quercetin. A powerhouse for such a simple flower. It is a powerhouse of food and medicine. The leaves, you can certainly use in just about anything. Sandwiches, salads, casseroles, flowers. You can pickle them. If you don't want to make your own brine, then be sure to save a pickle, a pickle jar when you're done. Oh, strangling dog mine is getting me. And all you have to do is gather these flowers and throw them into a finished jar of pickles. And they kind of end up looking like capers when they're finished pickling. And of course, I'm gonna be picking some flowers today to save for a rainy day when I might need them or if somebody I know needs, needs them for a cough. Apparently they're very good for bronchitis. Oxide Daisy, add these to your daily diet. And now for the grand finale, I'm gonna take you to a different area. And what a way to end a video. This is Chance. This is a great place to come to. I get a walk, I get to explore the plant life, and at the end, Chance gets to have a swim, and, a, well, I could say a drink of fresh water, but it's not exactly that fresh, but it's refreshing for him. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Please, if you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing. Hit the thumbs up, the like button, and have a fantastic day.